Good evening. Welcome to the University Church of Christ Midweek Bible Study. We are thankful to God Almighty for blessing all of us with the opportunity to come together and to study from God's holy and divine word. I am Terrence McLean, minister of the University Church of Christ here in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, on behalf of, of the elders and their families, the deacons and their families, uh, as well as my beloved wife, as the evangelist, and all of the wonderful members. We thank all of you for joining us as we have come together to study on tonight from God's holy and divine word. Before we begin our study, um, there are some announcements and prayer requests. Uh, as a result of uh, the Lord calling home Brother Wash McCall, uh, Junior. Uh, his services will be on this Friday, November 12th. Uh, the family hour will start at 10 o'clock a.m. and the funeral will start at 11 o'clock a.m. Uh, the location will be the North Hill Church of Christ at 897 Columbia Avenue in Akron, Ohio. Uh, we want to continue to lift uh, Sister uh, Rebecca McCall, as well as her daughter Sandra, uh, before God's throne of grace, that he might comfort them, uh, might comfort the entire North Hill Church of Christ. Uh, Brother McCall was the minister emeritus there, and one of his uh, protégés, uh, Brother Adriel Wilson, uh, a great gospel preacher in his own right, uh, serves as the minister there. Uh, he comes from great stock, his father, James Wilson, Sr., uh, a great gospel preacher. Uh, his brother uh, is also James Jr., a great gospel preacher. He has sisters that sing the gospel in a marvelous way. Uh, so we want to continue to remember uh, the Wilson family, Brother Wilson, uh, as the minister there and the entire North Hill Church. Uh, the giveaway at the University Church of Christ will be Tuesday, November 16th from 10 a.m. to 12 o'clock p.m. Uh, if more information is needed, please speak with Brother Anthony Slade or Brother James Bentley. Uh, Brother Robert Cottingham thanks everyone for their prayers. His procedure went well on last week. Uh, don't forget that Veterans Day, according to the announcement I have been given, is tomorrow. Happy Veterans Day to all of our veterans, uh, especially those who are members of the University Church of Christ. We thank you and salute you for your service to our country. All veterans uh, throughout the body of Christ, we salute you and all veterans whether you are a member of the church or not, thank you for your service to our country. Uh, we want to continue to pray for my beloved wife, Linda McLean. Her surgical procedure will be on this Friday. Uh, and we are trusting that God will indeed make all things go, go well. Uh, we want to remember uh, our sister, uh, Rachel. Uh, Rachel uh, Wilson, uh, she's also scheduled for surgery in Detroit, and our prayer is that God will uh, bless that surgical procedure, that all will go well, and Rachel will be on the road to recovery. Sister Emma Brown is requesting prayer for her sister-in-law, Sister Mary Morell in New Smyrna, Florida. Uh, Sister Mary has double pneumonia and COVID, and we certainly want to continue to lift Sister Emma Brown and her sister-in-law in prayer. Brother and Sister Nate Wright Sr. are asking for traveling grace, and we certainly want God to watch over, protect, and keep them as they travel. Continue to prayer for all of those who have made previous prayer requests. Uh, we certainly want to uh, remember Sharon Foster, who is still in the hospital, or is out of the hospital now, uh, but she is still on the road to recovery. 
we want to continue to pray for her total healing. Continue to keep all those who have lost loved ones in your prayers. Uh, also remember uh, Mary Alice Ford, our children, one of, our, one of the aunts, beloved aunts of our children. Uh, she is in the hospital there in Detroit, and uh, we just ask God to continue to be with those who are ministering to her needs. The virtual classes for the men and women will meet every third and fourth Sunday. So uh, not this coming Sunday, but a week from this Sunday, uh, the third Sunday, our sisters will have their class at 5 o'clock, and then the following Sunday, the fourth Sunday, the men will have their class. If you want information on how to tune into those virtual classes, uh, please call the church office. Uh, remember to pray for all our sick and shut-in brothers and sisters, their families, and all those administering to the health and care of our loved ones. Continue to pray for our elders, uh, Brother Frank Barnes, Brother Donald Nelson, Brother Greg Shields, and their families. Continue to pray for our deacons, uh, Brother Freddie Gibson and Brother Anthony Slade and their families. Please continue to pray for uh, me as your evangelist and my beloved wife, Linda as we work together uh, with the elders, deacons, and all of the wonderful members to be the kind of church that God will have us to be. Uh, also, we want to, to welcome, as a part of uh, the University Church staff, Sharice Thomas. Uh, she has begun working as our secretary this week. Uh, she was on training under Sister Nicole Bird on last week. We thank Nicole for that. Uh, and Sharice has uh, seemed to pick up things extremely well. So when you call in, you will have a new voice, a new person uh, who is going to be greeting you and we look forward to working with Sharice Thomas. Remember to pray for the entire body of Christ all around the world, uh, especially uh, here in the Cleveland area. Uh, we certainly want to pray for the great, Greater Heights Church of Christ, Brother Kevin uh, McHenry, his wife Tamika and the brethren who work with him and her there. Uh, as they have moved into their new building, and we are thankful to God for God blessing them with that building. Their first service was this past Sunday. We also want to remember Brother uh, Ernest Bates and um, Ray Siggers, ministers, co-ministers of the Church of Christ at 131st Street, which will soon be uh, the Center Road Church of Christ. They will be moving shortly into their new facility and we want to continue to pray uh, for those ministries as well. So at this time, if you will, uh, bow with me as we go to God in prayer. Gracious and eternal Father, we thank you for the blessings of life that you've given us. Thank you so very much for the opportunity to come together to study your word and I pray, oh God, that you'd bring to my memory what I have studied and use me as your mouthpiece first and foremost to get yourself some glory also that I might lift up Jesus so everyone will be drawn to him and may the saints of God not just at the University Church of Christ but throughout this great brotherhood of ours throughout the world be encouraged and strengthened in their faith Father, I ask that you would take this word and convict the hearts of those who have not yet obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that's been delivered to us in the New Testament, the gospel that's your power unto salvation. And Father, we ask for your comfort for those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. Uh, we're still mindful of uh, Brother Arnold Patterson and Brother James Patterson and their families as well as the Church of Christ at the Boulevard and the passing of Brother Floyd Patterson. Continue to comfort them. Uh, continue to comfort Sister Gail Evans. Uh, it's our understanding she had a, a nephew who passed away uh, on this week. Uh, we just ask you to comfort her and strengthen her, guide and keep her 
and the entire family and your loving care. Uh, we know she's still grieving the loss of a niece a few weeks ago and just ask you to strengthen her and, and to keep her. Uh, be with my beloved wife, Linda, uh, as she and her family have lost so many, so many loved ones. And I say her family, but her family is my family. So our family has, has lost so many on her side as well as on, on my side. Be with uh, my cousin Mary and Bell and the passing of her husband and she is the first cousin of my mother be with my mother uh, Talia McLean comfort her uh, strengthen her and continue to guide and keep her as well and your prayers and our prayers father we pray for all of the sick uh, we pray for our own beloved sister Sharon Foster uh, please continue to be with those who are ministering to her as they continue to make decisions about her medical well-being. Uh, continue to be with her sister, Sister Cherie Warner, because uh, our beloved sister also has had her health challenges, but she continues to fight the good fight of faith. So we ask you to comfort her. Be with Rachel, uh, our sister there in Detroit who has upcoming surgery. Continue to watch over her, protect and keep her be with those who are ministering to her her medical needs uh, father our prayer uh, is that you would be with my beloved wife linda as she prepares for uh, surgery on this coming friday uh, again we ask you to guide the hands the minds the thoughts the responses the reactions of all of the medical personnel that everything will go well with that procedure Father, I pray that you would be uh, with Sister Cherie and Sister Sharon uh, because they lost a nephew this week, uh, a young man who passed away. Uh, would you comfort them? Would you guide them? Would you cause them to remember that you are still with them? Uh, it's just so much going on in, in our world. Uh, be with Sister Emma Brown. We thank you for her and what she means to the University Church family. Uh, we pray especially for her sister-in-law, Sister Mary Morell in New Smyrna, Florida, who has been diagnosed with double pneumonia as well as COVID. Father, please guide the hands, the minds, the spirits of those who are ministering to her. Give all of those traveling grace who have traveled away from us bring them back safely uh, give those who are planning to travel like brother and sister uh, nate wright senior who will be uh traveling and need your traveling grace as as, as well uh, father we're just so thankful for all of the members of the body of christ uh, who are watching uh, whether they're watching live there on the teleconference call watching later or watching on youtube just guide and protect and keep us through this study. In Jesus' name, uh, we pray. Uh, I pray for Sister Dora Smith. I don't want to leave her out. She has been having some health struggles. Uh, and we just ask you to continue to be with her, so faithful, so strong, uh, caring for grandchildren way down in Tennessee and seeing about their well-being while she's also continuing to try to take care of her own uh, physical condition just guide protect and keep her in your loving care thank you for jesus now your son our savior and our lord forgive us of our sins it's in his mighty name we pray amen, amen. try to remember as many i hope i didn't forget anybody in in that particular uh prayer uh, we did include sister dora smith and i do thank sister mclean she has uh, giving me reminders of people who are standing in need of prayer. Uh, but it was interesting that the sermon on this past Lord's Day was uh, the great I am. And Sister Dora Smith, without even knowing that was going to be the sermon, and we had not yet received this beautiful card of encouragement she sent to Sister McLean, uh, and it was about I am talking about God and who he is and who he will be 
to each and every one of us, regardless of what storm we might find ourselves in. Uh, there are no coincidences, my wife Linda says, only God incidences. And she did not know I was preaching on I Am, and I definitely didn't know we were going to get a card about the great I Am. Uh, but our God is still alive. Uh, he's still in control. He's still awesome. He's still amazing. And yes, he is still surprising. But we're going to look at the Word of God now. And we're continuing our study from the book of Hebrews. We're going to start with chapter 7 tonight. And as we look at chapter 7, chapter 7 introduces us to the subject of Melchizedek and how Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so that's in verses 1 through, through 10. Uh, verses 11 through 19 say that he's not only the priest after the order of Melchizedek, but he's a new and better high priest that brings a new and better law. And that's from verse 11 through verse number 19. And then the third thing, and I don't know if we get to all three tonight or in this lesson, but the character of Jesus, our eternal high priest, after the order of Melchizedek in verses 20 through 28. So those are the three main points. Jesus a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, verses 1 through 10. A new and better high priest brings a new and better law, verses 11 through 19. And then the third Roman numeral is the character of Jesus, a eternal high priest after the order of Melchizedek, verses 20 through 28. But let's look at the word of God. Verse 1, 2, and 3 of Hebrews 7 read this way. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of God most high, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham divided a tenth part of all, being first by interpretation king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. That word that is translated order, order, after the order, was used in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 20. That word order means an arranging, generally an arrangement, metaphorically the post or position that a person holds. The author of Hebrews thereby identifies further the identity of Jesus to the Hebrew Christians and what he says to them is that Jesus holds the same post or position as did Melchizedek. Holds the same position. Who is Melchizedek? The text says he was the king of Salem. Salem is thought by many to be the city of Jerusalem due to the psalmist's use of it in Psalm 676 in verse number 2. King of Salem. He's also the priest of God most high. The word priest from the Hebrew Kohen, K-O-H-E-N, means one who offers sacrifice and ministers and other sacred things. Now this is important because remember uh, that Melchizedek shows up in the Old Testament before there was a Levitical priesthood. 
Apparently, there was a priesthood before that of Aaron and his descendants who were performing sacrifices to the Lord. God had given Adam and Eve laws regarding sacrifices as we see Cain and Abel doing so. God respected Abel's offering and not Cain's. Moses had instructed the priests not to come near the mountain as he received what we have called the Decalogue or the New Ten Commandment Law from God. In Exodus 19 and verse number 22. But all of these events took place before the Levitical priesthood was established. Tithes were offered to Melchizedek. No doubt to perform the acts of sacrifice to God. Before we find tithing connected to the Levitical priesthood. It goes on and says that this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of God most high, met Abraham returning from, from Dan. We have the record of Melchizedek and Abraham in Genesis chapter 14. Lot, Abraham's brother's son or Abraham's nephew, was captured in a war that took place at Sodom. The king of Elam had soundly defeated Sodom and Gomorrah and carried away many captives to Dan. Abraham gained intelligence of the location of Lot and took 318 trained men to rescue his nephew. Arriving at Dan, Abraham and his men defeat Lot's captors and bring both Lot and the spoils of Sodom and Gomorrah back. Melchizedek goes out to meet Abraham at the king's veil in Genesis chapter 14 and verse 17. And Melchizedek brought bread and wine to Abraham and blessed him. Abraham then gave Melchizedek a tenth of the spoils for a tithing offering. Melchizedek was a priest as well as a king. But the verse also says he was without father, mother, or genealogy. We know nothing of his posterity. We don't know who his ancestors were. We don't know where he came from. But it doesn't mean that Melchizedek came from nothing, but rather there is no record in the scriptures of his parentage or where he came from. So when it says Melchizedek had neither beginning of days nor end of life, but was made like unto the Son of God, here Melchizedek forms in his personage the complete type of Christ, no record of his posterity and no record of his beginning. Doesn't mean that he didn't have one. We just don't have a record of it. He simply appears at this moment in biblical history and then he disappears in the shadows of a type and an anti-type. So verse 4 through 10 reads like this. Now consider how great this man was, talking about Melchizedek, under whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth out of the chief spoils. And they indeed of the sons of Levi that received the priest's office have commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though these have come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not counted from them hath taken tithes of Abraham and hath blessed him that hath the promises. But without any dispute, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes. But there one of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And so to say, through Abraham, even Levi, who receiveth tithes, hath paid tithes. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. The author of Hebrews requests that his readers, the Hebrew Christians, consider, reflect on, examine, study, 
just how great Melchizedek was in relation to the Levitical priesthood. Our author reveals three ways that Melchizedek was superior to the Levitical priesthood. First, Melchizedek was supreme in that Abraham paid tithes to him. Since the tribe of Levi, the future priesthood was in the loins of Abraham. They had not come yet through his descendants. They too gave tithes to Melchizedek. When one pays tithes to another, it indicates their inferiority to the one who accepts the tithe. Now that's important. First, Melchizedek was supreme and that Abraham paid tithes to him. Secondly, note that this king that received tithes from the posterity of Abraham also blessed him that hath the promises, but without any dispute, the less is blessed of the better. Now that's what your Bible says. So here is Melchizedek, priest and king, received tithes from those who were still in Abraham's loins is what it means. But then he blesses Abraham. Abraham, the one who has the promises. But without any dispute, the less is blessed of the better. So the text says that the fact that Melchizedek blessed Abraham proves his superior rank over Abraham. Abraham is depicted as the father of the Hebrews, of the Jewish race. However, Melchizedek is pictured as superior of Abraham in that he blesses Abraham. Thirdly, the word here, H-E-R-E -E in verse 8, depicts the Levitical priesthood and the word there, T-H-E-R-E -E, refers to the administration of Melchizedek. Here, the Levitical priesthood, death was present. However, in the there, the priesthood of Melchizedek, death was not present. After the death of Aaron, his son Eleazar took the office of high priest. After Eleazar, his son Phinehas took the office, and then Abishua, and so on. The point being, they died, and another took their place. There's no record of Melchizedek's death, and so he appears to be a priest forever. Since mortality is inferior to immortality, Melchizedek is seen to be superior to the Levitical priesthood. Now watch this. These three points indicate the superiority of Melchizedek to the Levitical priesthood. But more importantly, the three points prove the superiority of Jesus Christ as our high priest to that of the Levitical priesthood, since Jesus is after the order or the equal position of Melchizedek. So the Hebrew author wants them to understand that, that you are being tempted. Remember we said that the context of the book of Hebrews is that there were Hebrew Christians because of persecution who were going back to the Levitical priesthood and the worship under the law. So what the Hebrew author is trying to get them to see is why would you go back to that which is inferior to the current priesthood of Jesus Christ who is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So he says in verse 11 through 19 that there is a new and better high priest who brings a new and better law. 
That's worth shouting about. It's interesting that there are just so many people who want to go back to the old law. And they want to emphasize the things under that old covenant and the old law that was given to Israel, not understanding that to do so, they must leave the new and better law. Watch this, verse 11. Now, if there was perfection through the Levitical priesthood, for under it hath the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be reckoned after the order of Aaron? If under that Levitical priesthood, people were made perfect, what's the need for the second one is what he asks. Now that word perfection comes from a Greek word that simply means accomplishment or fulfillment. According to the molten Greek-English uh, lexicon, it means the finality of function, completeness of operation and effect. The author of Hebrews poses a rhetorical question and, and a rhetorical question uh, can be defined or at least described this way. A rhetorical question is a question that has an obvious answer. The author of Hebrews poses a rhetorical question that was sure to be in the minds of his readers. If man could obtain, quote, perfection, unquote, or fellowship with God through the Levitical priesthood with its laws, what further need was there for another priest? This verse presupposes that the Hebrews considered the law of Moses a final word of authority and one that had the ability to remove their sins and give fellowship with God. This being the case, why should they look to another priesthood or another law? The two go together, priesthood and law. If the first one was sufficient for their salvation, what's the need for the second? Note the close connection between the Levitical priesthood and the law. The law of Moses, the Levitical law, the Levitical priesthood, the Levitical system, the law of Moses identified sin, according to Romans 7 and verse 7. Paul says there, you know, if... The law had not said, thou shalt not covet. I would not have known that coveting is sin. Galatians 3 said that that same law that made you aware of sin is something that also at least restrains sin. It doesn't eradicate it altogether, but at least it kind of puts a governor on your sinfulness. But it did not have the power to remove sin. Identify sin, yes. Restrain sin, yes. But to remove sin, no. So verse 12 says this, For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Is that in your Bible? Wait a minute. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. If we have to change the priesthood, then that also means the law has to change. Now we begin to see the big picture. If the Levitical priesthood and the law that they represented is proved inferior to the priesthood of Jesus Christ, which is after the order of Melchizedek, then the law of Moses is found to be inferior to the law of Jesus Christ because it could not remove sin. Or oh, in other words, it could not make a man or a woman perfect in the sight of God. Since there is a close connection between the priesthood and law, it stands to reason that if a new priest has been established, then a new law is established. 
listen to verse 13 and 14. For he of whom these things are said belongs to another tribe from which no man hath given attendance at the altar. For it, it is evident that our Lord has sprung out of Judah. As to which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priests. Hmm. You see, every priest in the Old Testament had to come from the tribe of Levi. The Hebrew author is saying here, but Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. And Moses didn't say anything about priests coming from the tribe of Judah. Here the author of Hebrews makes a very pointed statement regarding the subject at hand. Jesus is the priest after the order of Melchizedek and the one that belongs to another tribe, one other than that of Levi. Jesus was of the seed of David. He was of the tribe of Judah. When you get a chance, look at Psalm 110, verse 1, and the verses following, and then Jeremiah 23, verse 5. Now, I want you to think very clear, slowly about this. Here is a lesson on the authority of God. Brother McLean, what do you mean? God simply spoke in the Old Testament, stating that the priesthood of his people would come of the tribe of Levi and through the sons of Aaron. You can find that in Numbers chapter 16, verse 1, through Numbers chapter 18, verse 7. And the Lord did not have to say to his people under the Old Testament law, Thou shalt not allow those of Dan, Judah, Gad, Reuben, etc. to serve as priests. When God gives a command, it excludes all other options. For example, the Lord's Supper was instituted on the night in which Jesus was betrayed in Matthew 26, verse 26, and the verses following. Jesus used unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine to represent his flesh and blood. And a direct command is given in 1 Corinthians 11.23 for Christians to partake of this supper every first day of the week, according to Acts 20 and verse 7. The Lord did not have to say, thou shalt not use potato chips and orange juice in this observance, because he gave specifically what he did desire to be served. Unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. Not this Lipton iced tea lemon that I love so much. Unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine. The vine being the grape. God has authority. So we must respect God's commands. Never try to add to his holy word. But if God gave the command under the Old Testament, is he not still God when he gives a command under the New Testament? And if as God he gave a command under the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, is he not God enough to have the authority to have his new command given under a new covenant instituted by a new high priest to supersede his old command. Oh, I hear y'all thinking now. And so that's what the Hebrew author goes on and says. Watch this, verse 15. And what we say is yet more abundantly evident. If after the likeness of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest who hath been made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life, 
For it is witnessed of him, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus Christ of the tribe of Judah is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord's priesthood does not coincide with the Mosaic law. Numbers chapter 17 verse 1 through 9. The priesthood of Aaron obtained their position as high priest through birth. Whereas Jesus was not born into this relationship, but he was appointed by Jehovah God, his heavenly father. These statements represent the permanency of both the new law under Jesus Christ, as well as his priesthood, which the Bible calls endless. The law of Christ will not end nor be abrogated by another law. In other words, there's not a new law coming. The law under the new covenant that was given when Jesus was resurrected from the dead and made both Lord and Christ, and now the high priest under the new covenant, not only the high priest that offers the sacrifice, he was the sacrifice that he offered as high priest. The law of Christ will never end because he has an endless life. You remember in Revelation it says, in, in chapter 2 I believe it is, no chapter 1, he says, I am he who was dead and behold now I am alive forever more. The law of Christ provides eternal fellowship between man and God. And so the author of Hebrews quotes from Psalm 110 and verse 4. It was and it is still God's sovereign choice to appoint Jesus for the work of New Testament high priests. Watch this, verse 18 and 19. For there is a disannulling of a foregoing commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. Remember, for the law made nothing perfect. And the bringing in thereupon of a better hope through which we draw nigh unto God. Watch this. There is a word in verse 18. A disannulling. It means to set aside. Notice it says, what was set aside was a foregoing commandment. Or a, a commandment that came before. It's equated in the context to the law that the Levitical priesthood was associated with, the Mosaic law. First, the author of Hebrews proves to the Hebrew Christians that the Mosaic law is set aside because there's a new priesthood in Hebrews 7 and verse 12. Secondly, he explains that the Mosaic law has been set aside for another law because of its, being the Mosaic law, Weakness and unprofitableness. It is appropriate that the author speaks of the Mosaic law being disannulled. Rather than saying that it is totally useless and should be cast out completely. Because we know there is much to learn from the Mosaic law. If you have a Bible... And it hopefully you do. Turn to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 11. Talking about what happened 
to them in the wilderness. Watch what it says. Now these things happen unto them by way of example. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages are come. Look back at Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for a learning that through patience and through comfort of the scriptures we might have hope. We might have hope. The weakness and the unprofitableness of the Mosaic law is now clearly identified. The Mosaic law made nothing perfect. And the idea of perfection here is the idea of being without sin and in fellowship with God. The inference is clear. The law of Christ would make man perfect and therefore it is a law that offers a better hope than that of the Mosaic law. Here is the second better statement for the Christian. The first one was in Hebrews 6 and verse 9. Our hope is to be rewarded with God's promise of eternal salvation. This hope can only be realized through Jesus Christ and given to us through the gospel message. Wow. The law of Christ would make man perfect and therefore it's a law that offers a better hope. I said to the church, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Brother McClain, why are you, you leaning on Jesus' name? Mm -hmm. Well, because of the character of Jesus. Our eternal high priest, after the order of of Melchizedek verses 20 through 28 verses 20 through 22 read this way and inasmuch as it is not without the taking of an oath for they indeed have been made priests without an oath but he with an oath by him that saith of him the Lord swear and will not repent himself thou art a priest forever by so much also hath Jesus become the surety of a better covenant. Wow. Again, this is a quote from Psalm 110 and verse 4. Compare that psalm, that verse, with Hebrews 6, verse 15, and the verses following, and then, of course, Hebrews 7, we just went over verse 16 and 17. It indicates the fact that Jesus is appointed by an everlasting oath. And it was and still is God's sovereign choice for him to be a priest. The Levitical priesthood, along with the Mosaic law, has been disannulled. That's not my word. That's not Brother McLean. That, that's not any other gospel preacher. Uh, that's not any other, quote, member of the church. That's the word of God. The Mosaic law has been disannulled. That is set aside. 
it had served its purpose. As I said, to help man identify sin, Romans chapter 7 and verse number 7. Okay, Romans 7 verse number 7. And then to restrain sin, Galatians 3 and verse number 19. And to help man see their need for Jesus, Galatians 3, verse 24 and the verses following. Due to the Mosaic Law's imperfections, it could not make men perfect then. It definitely can't make man perfect now that we have a new and better covenant. Notice the text says Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. That word surety comes from a Greek word that means giving security. Or as Moulton in his lexicon says, a pledge or formal promise made to secure or a pledge, I'm sorry, a surety and a sponsor. Another lexicon of the Greek language says a pledge or formal promise made to secure against loss, damage, or default, guarantee or security. Notice it says who, who the security is. The one who has an endless life. He is the surety. The text says, Jesus hath become the surety of a better covenant. A better one. The word covenant simply means an arrangement between two parties. An agreement. The Mosaic law is termed a covenant. Moses told Israel in Deuteronomy 29 verse 9, Keep therefore the words of this covenant and do them, that ye may prosper in all that ye do. And then in Psalm 111 verse 9, the psalmist said, He has sent redemption to his people, he has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. That's in the American Standard Version. King James Version says holy and reverend is, is his name. So God has sworn an oath, appointed Jesus to be an eternal priest after the order of Melchizedek. God's oath was for our eternal salvation. Jesus serves as a surety, a security for that salvation when one obeys his covenant law. Like many other previous issues, Jesus being a high priest and later after the order of Melchizedek, the author of Hebrews is introducing us to a new topic, a new and better covenant law. So he goes on and says in verse 23 and 24, And they indeed have been made priests, many in number, because that by death they are hindered from continuing. But he, because he abideth forever, had his priesthood unchangeable. Did you hear that? Because he abideth forever, hath his priesthood unchangeable. Stated clearly now. Jesus is superior to the Levitical priesthood in that he is not limited by death as they are or were. Seeing as Jesus does not die, neither does his covenant law die or cease to be. And so it goes on and says in verse 25, Wherefore also he is able to save to the uttermost 
them that draw near unto God through him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. How do men draw near to God? What Jesus said in John 6, verse 44 and 45, No man can come to me except the Father that sent me draw him, and I will raise him up in the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone that hath heard from the Father and hath learned cometh unto me. To draw near unto God is to draw near to Christ through hearing, learning, and being taught. Taught what? The law of Christ. The covenant. Such a one that is taught and obedient will be saved. It says that he ever lives to make intercession. I am so glad that at this very moment, he's on the right hand of God making intercession for me and my wife. We're, we're not really worried about the surgery or even all of the other health struggles she's had this past couple of years because we know we have an endless priest, high priest, who intercedes on our behalf before the throne of God. Even when all we can do is moan or groan or cry, we know we have the Holy Spirit who will take our cry to God with words that cannot be uttered. And he with Jesus makes intercession for us. He ever lives to make intercession for those who are being saved through hearing, learning, and being taught. The word intercession means to converse with, talk to, to intercede, to plead on another's behalf, to act as mediator in a dispute with or to entreat. We saw in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, that Jesus is our mediator even in 2021. Right now, at this very moment, he is mediating between you and I and God the Father. Pleading on our behalf. And so it says in verse 26, watch this. For such a high priest became us holy, guileless, undefiled separated from sinners and made higher than the heavens. Wow. In what way did Jesus became us to be distinguished, to shine forth, to be clearly seen, to be conspicuously fit or suited or fitting? Jesus was and is suited to be a high priest that makes intercession for us through a new covenant law because, number one, he's holy. He's pure, sacred observance of all duties toward God. Clearly the word indicates the fact that Jesus never one time sinned while here on this earth. When you get a chance, look at John 8 verse 46. Look back in Hebrews 4 verse 15. He's holy, meaning he's pure. He is, he is guileless. In other words, unknowing of ill, he's innocent, simple. Moulton says he's free from evil. Innocent, blameless. Jesus was innocent in relation to the law during the time in which he lived here on earth. No guile was found in his mouth. He never sinned. So it goes on and says he's undefiled, not stained, not defiled, not sullied, not tainted. Jesus kept himself pure in both word and deed. Truly, when he went to the cross, he was completely innocent of all charges. sinless. He is separated from sinners. 
Though Jesus taught sinners, he did not participate in sin with anyone. In fact, he exposed their sinful deeds. And it says he's made higher than the heavens. He ascended into the heavens to be with his Father. Acts chapter 1, verse 9, in the verses following, while they yet looked into heaven, a cloud came and took him up, and he ascended to heaven on the cloud. And the angel said, Ye men of Israel, why stand ye, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing into heaven? The same Jesus, in like manner as he's gone up into heaven, will come again. All of these traits add up to the fact that Jesus never sinned. Verse 27 and 28 says, Who needeth not daily, like those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appointeth men high priests having infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was after the law, appointed the Son perfected forevermore. I want you to stop to think about this. Under the Mosaic law, and what these Hebrew Christians were trying to go back to, the priests would make daily sacrifices for the sins of the people. Animals were slaughtered daily and burnt on the altar. A lamb was offered in the morning and another in the evening every single day. Wow. When you get a chance, look at Exodus 29, verse 38, and the verses following, and then, then Numbers chapter 28, verse 1 through 10. But just think about that. You know, you know, I love my baby back ribs. But don't leave them on the grill too long. I, and, not, and not only leave them on, but to do it in the morning and in the evening every day. The high priest would offer a sin offering once a year for both himself and for the people. It's called the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 16, verse 11. The point being that the high priest was no different than the rest of Israel and that he too sinned and needed the expiation of his sins. But we have a high priest who never committed a sin, he laid down his perfect life as a sacrifice for man's sins, not his. Or Isaiah put it this way in Isaiah 53 and verse 7, as a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and as a sheep that before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. The Mosaic law appointed the sons of Aaron to be priests, these high priests would make atonement for their own sins and the sins of the people once a year. The law that these priests operated under could not remove sins and thereby neither could their sacrifices. So God appointed Jesus to be the eternal high priest. And the law of Christ instructs man to receive the forgiveness of sins through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. So the full picture is given regarding the superiority of Christ's priesthood. An imperfect priesthood that represented an imperfect law made imperfect sacrifices to appease the Lord. Compare Leviticus 1 verse 1 and the verses following. Seeing that the sacrifices were imperfect, they were made day by day and year by year. But not so with the perfect sacrifice, Jesus, who represents a perfect law and a perfect priesthood. What makes Jesus Christ superior? He represents and offers perfection, sinless perfection. Sins are completely forgiven under the law of Jesus Christ, and thereby he is superior. 
Jesus was therefore a perfect high priest who represented a perfect law that operates under a perfect sacrifice. Ah, he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And because of his sinless life, he ever lives to make intercession for the saints of God. Thank you for joining me in this study tonight. Amen. And before I conclude this study, it's imperative that I tell you how, how then do you become covered by his priesthood? You just hear how Jesus came to this earth, lived, died on the cross for your sins, was buried, got up from the dead, and went back to heaven according to the scriptures. You hear the gospel. Those are the facts of the gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1 through 5. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And then you have to believe. I shared with the church this past Lord's Day when I talked about the great I am, that in John 8, 24, when we read it in the English, it says, Except you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins, and where I am you cannot come, in the English but in the Greek, it's really, unless you believe that I am he, or that I am. Much like when Moses asked God, who shall I tell Pharaoh and Israel has sent me to tell Pharaoh to let them go? God said, just tell him I am that I am. So when Jesus said, except you believe that I am, except you believe that I am the Son of God, unless you believe that I am Emmanuel, God with us. You shall die in your sins. Where I am, you cannot come. Hear that? Believe that? Repent of your sins. Luke 13, 3 and 5, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Confess with the mouth that Jesus Christ is God's Son. Matthew 10, 32, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. And then... Be buried in water for the rem remember. God had the authority to appoint the high priest and the Old Testament law, just like God has the authority. Jehovah God has the authority to appoint the high priest under the New Testament and the New Covenant law. And the last step before entrance into a right relationship with Him after hearing, believing, repenting, and confessing is baptism for the remission of sins. You see, it was the high priest who said in Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Would you pray with me? Gracious and eternal Father, thank you for this day, for the blessing of life you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity to teach your word. Father, my prayer is that your Holy Spirit will take this word and convict all of our hearts. For those of us who are Christians, convict us of the truth that we have a high priest with an endless life who not only make sacrifice. He himself is the sacrifice for our sins. We've obeyed the gospel so that we can be made perfect in relationship with you. Father, we pray that those who have fallen away will be restored in their walk with you. And we pray that those who have not yet obeyed the gospel We'll search the scriptures to see whether those things are so we've said on this evening. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, and our Lord. Shortly we will dismiss ourselves from this platform, but we are mindful that we're never out of your presence. Keep us until the next appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before I close this lesson to my only begotten son, my Monaghan son, Terrence Richard McLean Jr., happy 37th birthday.
my beloved son. To all of you who are Christians, remember to do something that only a Christian would do, and whether you're a Christian or not, remember God loves you, Jesus died for you, I love you, and I am your servant for Jesus' sake.